Greetings and welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Grace United Methodist Church Sunday Virtual Worship Service. And I am your brother, Minister Brian Hyman, here to welcome you. So, get ready to be blessed by the Lord. The announcements are as follows. Celebrating Black History Month. During February, Grace will celebrate the accomplishments of African Americans. Join us each Sunday for a different recognition. This Sunday, we will highlight the contributions of Dr. Charles A. Tindley, a United Methodist minister, hymn writer, and gospel composer. Next Sunday, we will recognize the historic achievement of Vice President Kamala Harris. Remember, celebrating black history is an everyday occurrence. Communion Sunday. Today is Communion Sunday, so be prepared to take communion during the worship service. We will also have communion at 2 p.m. via teleconference. We ask that you have a cracker or bread and juice available to partake in this service. The communion ritual document will be within the bulletin. Virtual and Adult Sunday School. Oh, and Youth Sunday School. The Adult Virtual Sunday School will be held today from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And Youth Sunday School will be held today at 2 p.m. Lenten Bible Study coming soon. Grace will hold its next six-week Bible study series beginning February 18, 2020 at 7 p.m. We will study Bishop Samara Lewis, his book, Journey to Transformation. Biblically based, this study will carry you through the Lenten season with understanding and affirmation of Jesus' love for us. If you plan to participate in this excellent study, contact the church office to register for the class by February 10, 2020. The facilitator for this class is Sister Robinson, our lay leader. Please refer to the electronic bulletin on our website um, for contact information for these classes and prayer service. Amen. In the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is a very important scripture, especially during the time in which we are living in today. Let us pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, we come to you today giving you all the thanks, all the praise, and all the glory, and all the honor. Lord God, we know that we could not move another day, live another day, see another day, without your blessings, Lord God. So we say thank you over and over again, Lord God, because what would we be without you, Heavenly Father? Lord God Almighty, there are so many, so many things that are going on in this world today that we need you, Lord God. We need to have an understanding to what is really happening, Lord God. And we pray and we believe because we have faith in you, Lord God, that you will show us the answers, Lord God, if we stay faithful. You say that if we humble ourselves, Lord God, you will teach us, Lord God. So today we pray for humility that we may be able to hear you in the quiet places, the, the still small voice, Lord God, that you talk to us in. We just thank you so very much for this, Lord God. We thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this country that we live in, the changes, the positive change that is going on, Lord God. We all can see it, we all can feel it, and we all know that you were in charge even with all of the turmoil that pops up every now and then. But Heavenly Father, we just pray continuously in your guidance, in your protection, and in your wisdom, Lord God. 
We thank you so much for your sacrifice in your son, Jesus Christ, Lord God, our Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord God, for the Holy Spirit, the gift that you give us, giving us another gift, Lord God. Thank you so very much for what will we do and where will we be without you, Lord God. So, Heavenly Father, I want to pray for the sick and for the shut-in, Lord God. You know, we are all shut-in at this period of time to some degree. But, Lord God, I'm speaking of those who are really stuck, Heavenly Father. I wish and I pray that you continue to encourage them, Lord God. Lift them up. Heal them like I know you can, like we know you can. We've seen your work over and over again. And we thank you, Lord God. There is no God but you. We thank you so very much. And we would like to pray a special prayer for our pastor Smothers, Heavenly Father. We thank you that he has undergone his surgery and he is doing well. All because you said so. So we thank you again for, for blessing him, our pastor. And we thank you for blessing the church congregation and all the members of the church universal. We thank you, Lord God. We praise you, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you. And we say, Amen. listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his questions. When his parents saw him, 
They were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God of grace and mercy, you are the source of the true healing that can make us whole. We remember this morning that Jesus' ministry was deeply involved in both healing of people's bodies and healing of relationships. As we take time now in worship to offer our gifts to you, we pray that you might use these gifts to bring healing of body, of spirit, of broken relationships to people who are in desperate need. We pray this in Jesus holy name. Amen. Here at Grace we have several different ways of giving. One way is online giving. You can visit our website at www.gracefortwashington.org click on the giving button that simple or you can mail in your offering Grace United Methodist Church 11700 Old Fort Road Fort Washington Maryland 20744 and please make your checks payable to Grace United Methodist Church or Grace UMC or you can Drop your offerings at the church at 11700 Old Fort Road, Fort Washington, Maryland. Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome Reverend Tony Love back to Grace United Methodist Church. I will read his bio for you. The Reverend Tony C. Love, an ordained elder, is the assistant to the Bishop of the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church. Reverend Love, a son of Christ United Methodist Church in Acaso, Maryland, received his calling under one of Grace's former pastors, Reverend Conrad D. Parker, in, in 1992 with the support of the Christ Church family. He stepped out in faith to serve the Cochrane Memorial United Methodist Church in Temple Hills, Maryland, as the assistant minister. Since then, he has pastored at Zion United Methodist Church in Lexington Park and at New Faith Community of Covenant Point. It merged to become Covenant Point Lakeside Corporative Parish. Later, the church was known as the Journey of Faith Church. A native of Prince George's County, Maryland, Reverend Love received his education from Bishop McNamara High School in Forestville, Maryland. He graduated from the University of Maryland College Park with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature and Language. He holds a Master of Divinity degree from Howard University School of Divinity in Washington, D.C and is a member of the 1999 World Methodist Council's Order of Faithful Leaders and as Mission Evangelist. He is also a graduate of the Leadership Prince George's Class 2004. Within the Baltimore Washington Conference, Reverend Love has served on several board and com committees. He has held positions of chairperson of the Conference Board of Trustees on the Washington East District. He has mentored candidates for the ordained ministry and has provided instruction at leadership days across the conference. Beyond the conference, Reverend Love serves as the executive director 
of the Northeast Jurisdiction Multi-Ethnic Center for Ministry and the Vice Chairperson of Black Methodist for Church Renewal Incorporated. That's a lot. Following the Black History Moment and Worship Through Music, the next voice you will hear will be of Reverend Tony Love. Be blessed. Today for Black History Month, we shall lift up one of our musical giants, Reverend Dr. Charles Albert Tinley, who was born in Maryland in 1851 and died July 1933. He was an African-American Methodist minister and a gospel music composer. He was born the son of slave parents, Charles and Esther Tenley. Reverend Tenley experienced a hard life for his mother died when he was only four years old. And the following year, he was separated from his father. Never able to go to school, Tenley had a burning desire to learn to read and write. Therefore, he learned on his own by asking people to tutor him. He mastered reading and writing when he was 17. Shortly after the Civil War, he moved to Philadelphia with his wife, Daisy, and worked as a brick carrier, a janitor at a small church, and attended night school. He even took a correspondence course from the Boston School of Theology, where he learned Hebrew and Greek. Often referred to as the Prince of Preachers, Tinley founded one of the largest Methodist congregations serving the African-American community on the East Coast of the United States. Without any degree, he was ordained to the Methodist Episcopal Church by examination with high-ranking scores. He was also ordained as a deacon in the Delaware Conference in 1887 and as an elder in 1889. He was assigned by his bishop to serve as an itinerant pastor staying a relatively short time at each charge in New Jersey, Delaware, and then in Maryland in 1891. Amazingly, in 1902, he became pastor of the Bainbridge Street Methodist Church of Philadelphia, the same church where he had once been a janitor. So successful was his leadership that in 1907, a new building was needed for the growing congregation. A new building renamed the Tenley Temple Methodist Church. Here he preached to great throngs of people, both blacks and whites were represented in the leadership of the church, along with Italians, Jews, Germans, Norwegians, Mexicans, and also Danes. Eventually he was presented the Doctor of Divinity degree by Bennett College and Morgan College in Baltimore, Maryland. Tinley was also a noted songwriter and composer of gospel hymns and is recognized as one of the founding fathers of American gospel music. Five of his hymns appear in the 1989 United Methodist Hymnal. He wrote both words and music for many gospel songs, among the most popular of which are Nothing Between, Leave It There, I Have Found a Last a Savior, Stand By Me, We'll understand it better by and by. It was Tinley's song, I'll Overcome Someday, written in 1901, that served as a basis for We Shall Overcome, a theme song of the Civil Rights Movement. We appreciate Reverend Charles Albert Tinley and thank him for all his accomplishments, with, which have been an inspiration for so many of us. Now let's listen to one of his compositions, Beams of Heaven.
morning to you, my sisters and brothers in Christ. Greetings of grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is our Lord. This Sunday morning, we are going to consider for this sermon, the gospel that has been read, the good news as written by Luke coming out of the second chapter and it's verses 41 through 52. Will you join with me in a word of prayer? Loving and gracious God, I ask now that you would still me as I stand at your sacred desk. Speak through me that your people will hear your voice and challenge us that we may become the disciples you need us to be, not only in our yesterdays, but for all the tomorrows you have promised us. This is your servant's prayer, asking in the name of he who is Christ Jesus, he is Lord. Amen. Bible scholars and followers of God's word will understand that Luke, Luke is a historian. That is to say that Luke, when Luke writes, seeks to pin accurate, if not precise, information regarding the actions, the events of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus who is the Christ. When it comes to the gospel of Luke, his version of this good news, he pins these stories in order to reveal the humanity of Jesus, as well as the divinity of he who is the Christ. For Jesus is the son of God, but also is the son of man. Today, Grace, family and friends of God, I'd like to preach from the sermon title, a departure into destiny, a departure into destiny. Beloved, let us journey together as we examine and explore God's holy word. According to the Jewish tradition, Jewish faith, believers were expected to make three pilgrimages from their hometowns to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was considered the center of their praise and worship. They were to come to Jerusalem, to the temple for Passover, Pentecost, and the tabernacles. If the journey was extremely long or extraordinary long, the pilgrims were required to attend the Passover only. It was their religious law. So we discover in our scripture lesson for today that Joseph and Mary and Jesus, along with relatives and friends, they're making their pilgrimage. They're taking their journey from Galilee, the town of Nazareth, to the temple in Jerusalem. When Jesus is, the Bible says, 12 years old. Luke notes for us Jesus's age because Luke wants us, the readers, to understand that Jesus is being brought up in the faith, is being taught and instructed in the ways of his faith. I hear the scripture lesson, train up a child in the way that he or she should go and when he or she is old, they shall not depart from it. Also, we need to understand Luke wants us to know that Jesus is being obedient unto his Jewish faith tradition by going to the Passover. See, at the age of 12, Jesus is seen as a son of the law and could start serving, being a servant of God, a servant of Jehovah, a servant of the Most High and Holy One. So Joseph, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, their relatives and friends, they make this pilgrimage, they take this journey to Jerusalem. They're going to the temple that they may observe the Passover. The Passover is the remembrance of God's faithfulness when God delivered his people from the hands of Pharaoh with the plague of the death of the firstborn male. Because God's people, the Israelites, shared the blood of a lamb and posted the blood upon the doorposts of their dwellings, their homes, that night when death fell upon the land, all homes covered by the lamb's blood were spared the loss of the firstborn male. No death entered into their dwellings or claimed their firstborn male. But those without the blood sacrifice, those without the covering, they witnessed the loss of life. Even Pharaoh lost his firstborn son. 
And in response to God's action, this plague, Pharaoh set God's people, the Israelites, free. Free from the oppressive bondage and slavery they experienced at the hand of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's people. Therefore, it is that Jesus and his parents, relatives, and friends, they now return to Jerusalem's temple that they might observe this celebration. As our scripture, our scripture text reveals, when the seven-day festival was over, when it had ended, Mary and Joseph, relatives and friends, were headed back to Galilee, to Nazareth. Because they had traveled as a community, a community of faith, it was not uncommon for Joseph and Mary not to look for Jesus as they returned home. It would have been an assumption, a, a reliable assumption, that somewhere among the relatives, family and friends, Jesus was hanging out when word spread that they were all to make their return trip. Therefore, Joseph and Mary did not inquire about Jesus, his whereabouts immediately or until a day had passed. In fact, it was a custom, it was a tradition that because of these pilgrimages, these journeys were anywhere between 18 to 30 miles in length, that on the first day of returning home, the people only traveled between three to eight miles. Their reasoning was that if by chance they had forgotten something or left something by mistake, they could quickly return to Jerusalem to retrieve it and then rejoin their fellow pilgrims by the next day. But because Joseph and Mary assumed, believed Jesus was among his family and friends. They journeyed an additional day when they realized Jesus was not to be found. Their return to the temple to Jerusalem meant they could not rejoin family and friends on the return to Nazareth. They were concerned, concerned for and about Jesus. So Joseph and Mary, they return to Jerusalem. They go there to find their son. After searching about the temple, because there were numerous places where Jesus could have been, they find Jesus engaged in theological discourse, having conversation with the teachers of law, God's word. While engaged in this conversation, theological discourse, the study of God and God's word, Jesus is noted as astonishing and amazing, the teachers in the temple. Jesus' understanding is his replies, his answers demonstrate not only that Jesus was being taught in the ways of God in the Jewish faith tradition, but it was clearly evident that the presence of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost was within Jesus, leading him in all truth. Jesus was not only just a bright boy, but also a young boy with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. When confronted, confronted by his parents about his actions, his decision to stay in Jerusalem, the temple, Jesus answers that he had to be in his father's house. Or as in King James Version of the Bible, it records, Jesus had to be about his father's business. A departure into destiny. Beloved, I would like to define destiny as God's divine design for our lives. When Jesus replied that he had to be about his father's house, about his father's business, in other words, the first words ever recorded as spoken by Jesus, he announces God's divine design for his life. He, Jesus, is to be about his father's business. Just as his last words confirm, it is finished. When Jesus concludes his father's business, 
Jesus let it be known that he had to handle his father's business. He had to be in his father's house. It was God's divine design for Jesus's existence. And Jesus was going to be faithful to fulfill God's design by living into God's will and living into God's way. In order to live into God's divine design, destiny, we must know that Jesus had to make, or better yet, take a departure. Departure is defined as an action of leaving, typically to start a journey, a deviation from the accepted, perceived traditional course of action or thought. As our scripture lesson reveals, Jesus moves into destiny. His move into destiny required him to depart, to make or take a departure. A departure was required of him. I say that because first, Jesus had to break ties with the assumptions of customs and traditions or the ordinary everyday way of life. It was assumed by Joseph and Mary and probably many of the relatives that Jesus was among them when they determined to return home after the Passover. But in order for Jesus to be about his father's business, to be in his father's house, to live into his destiny, he had to break ties. In other words, without his parents' approval or permission. I'm not saying to be disrespectful, but I'm saying that Jesus had to make the decision to stay in Jerusalem. He had to stay in the temple because at that moment, he, Jesus, was leaning into his destiny. It was a moment in time when Jesus risked going beyond the boundaries, the established, perceived, accepted, usual, regular, because the pull into his destiny was greater than anything else in his life. At that moment. Secondly, I declare he had to make a departure, had to lean into his destiny. When Jesus makes or takes this departure, enters into his destiny, he does it alone. Note that he does it alone. He's not accompanied by loved ones, not supported by his family. He elected to depart, fully realizing that he would have to stand alone and be on his own. His departure pulled him out of, away from the crowd, from the other pilgrims. Beloved, when you determine destiny is calling you, destiny is beckoning you, you best be ready to step out of and from among the comfortable, the familiar, and the safety in order to live in to God's business. God will not always allow the road to destiny nor the departure to be easy. Your departure, my departure, may offer you and I a season of solitude, a wilderness experience, may give us some difficulty and challenges, or it may prove you and me with affirmation and confidence, but we'll never know it unless we're willing to risk moving out, moving up, moving beyond, ourselves. You and I, first, we must decide we're going to move or remove the safety nets and try, I mean, trust God. Who is God speaking to today, Grace? Who is God speaking to, beloved brothers and sisters? You're, you're departing into destiny. Is a place where you must understand God and say, you don't need anyone else. You don't need anyone else to legitimize. You don't need anyone else to sanction. You don't need anyone else to bless what God is calling you to do. So don't let other folk, other persons hinder you. Don't allow them to hem you in. It's a departure into destiny. Can't you see Jesus making the move? And then lastly, every time I wrestled with the word, every time I heard the word departure, I was reminded of 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse six, when Paul is telling Timothy that the time of his departure has come. The time for his departure has come. 
when you and I examine the word in the Greek for departure, as Paul uses it, it means to break up. As we would understand to leave, going from one place to another, from here to there, from this to that, to break up. But departure also, it leans itself to an understanding of to return. In other words, departure not only implies leaving as in we remove ourselves from, we're going away from, but it also can, also can imply a return to. Consider when Jesus took a departure into destiny, it wasn't so much that he left something as he actually returned to something. He didn't so much leave his ways as he returned to his ways. His departure returned him, Jesus, back to that which was not new to him, but familiar to him, his father's house and his father's business. Oh, beloved, on this day, I question, I question, maybe your departure, maybe my departure into destiny isn't so much a complete abandonment, but rather our departure into destiny is a call from God saying, I need you to reconnect with me, who is God and the business I'm asking you to do on my behalf. Maybe it's an understanding that God says your departure to destiny is you being more intimate with God, reconnecting with God through times of study and prayer and praise and worship. Maybe it's a reconnection of stepping forth to do the mission and the ministry God has called you to do. Maybe we need to stop fearing the departure because we have, we have assumed it will lead us to the unknown, when in reality, it's going to lead us back to what is known, and that is our God. Lead us back to a God who is Jehovah Jireh, our provider, a God who is a healer, a God who is a deliverer, a God who is a comforter. Oh, I'm inviting you this Lord's morning grace, family and friends of God. Let's get ready, let's get ready, get ready for our departure a departure into destiny because in departing, our destiny brings us back to God, maybe in new and exciting ways, more fulfilling ways. We need not fear surrendering, but we need to embrace this departure into destiny. Oh, brothers and sisters, yes, in this second month of a brand new year, I'm inviting you to know as we have crossed over into 2021, let us prepare ourselves. Let us prepare to depart into the divine design for our lives, into destiny, into what God has asked us to be a part of. Stop waiting to ask for permission or receive permission or approval but know that you would be willing to stand alone and believe in God that in your departure, it'll feel like home. So I am inviting you, get ready for the journey. Grace, let's get ready to take the pilgrimage for God is calling us to a departure, a departure into destiny. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen. Family and friends, those who have joined us today, maybe you want to participate in this destiny, this divine design by God in your life. And for some, the very first step is you must choose Jesus. In choosing Jesus, I'm saying you must accept the gift of salvation, relationship with the almighty God who's creator, sustainer of this world. And so today on behalf of Pastor Smothers and the great people of Grace Church, I make this introduction, I make this invitation for you to make a decision, to choose to be in relationship with God through accepting God's Son, Jesus the Christ, to be your friend, to be your Lord and your Savior. If today you would simply acknowledge 
that you have no relationship with God. You're not in relationship with Jesus. You're estranged. You've never had that relationship. Or the fact that you've been wandering in a lifestyle that is not pleasing to God, but you want to enter into relationship. Acknowledge that. And then believe that God has sent Jesus the Christ to do the work of salvation. And the work, the redemption of Jesus the Christ has been sufficient. It is whole. It is complete. And offers you the gift of abundant eternal life. And if you would confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior, you believe he's done a work sufficient, and you acknowledge, I want that relationship. We believe today the gift of salvation, the relationship with God through Jesus Christ has been given unto you. And now you're a participant in the family of faith, but also you're a participant in God's divine design. There's destiny in your life, and God is calling you to his will and God's way. We give thanks for your decision today. Maybe you reaffirmed that walk. You reaffirmed having that relationship today. We give thanks for your decision today. I invite you, if you're watching, listening today, place yourself in a church family. Place yourself among believers that can build you up along the journey. Grace United Methodist Church in Fort Washington is a wonderful place to do it. I realize we're not in person yet, but online through worship services and joining Bible study and other activities that are offered online. Become part of this household or another household of faith where you can meet with brothers and sisters who are journeying like you, who can help support you, walk alongside of you, encourage and inspire you. So reach out, reach out to Grace, reach out to a church family near you and grow in your grace and in your knowledge of Jesus, who is the Christ. I praise God for your decision this day. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, I invite you now to prepare yourselves as we engage in the service of Word and Table. That is that we're gonna celebrate communion. We come to the Lord's table. Won't you prepare yourselves? Hear this invitation. Christ, who is our Lord, invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace and with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love, and we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take a moment for silence. Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. With those who have gathered with you this day, if you are able, will you just take a moment to offer signs of reconciliation and love? It may be simply that you look towards someone and you just cross yourself and offer them a nod, an extension of love and grace and peace. Or certainly reach out and hug someone and bless them with your presence. Offer them the sign of reconciliation, a sign of love. As forgiven and reconciled people, let us now offer ourselves and our gifts unto God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere 
to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood, blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor in glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. In all God's people said, amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ, which is given for you, a body that had to be broken, that we could be made whole. Of the cup of salvation, through which we find the flow of the blood that forgives all our sins. This is the blood of Jesus the Christ through which we are also forgiven. From wherever you may be joining us on this day, I invite you to take the elements that are present with you and let us as a family share in communion. For at this table, there are no big eyes or little U's. We are all the same. And in the Methodist faith, it is an open table, meaning anyone and everyone can come. Because we do not understand the amazing grace that is this table that God extends. I am a servant at this table, but God writes the guest list. And on God's guest list, all, and I do mean all, are invited. So with the elements that you have, I invite you. The body of Jesus the Christ, which is given, take, eat, and be blessed. From the cup of salvation now, I invite you to take, drink, and know that your sins are forgiven.
and now as we prepare to go down from this table, we are empowered, we are given strength by the blood and the body of Jesus the Christ. Will you receive this blessing as we go down from this table? We go forth now in peace and the grace of the Lord Jesus the Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. This is our prayer in faith in all God's children said, amen. church family, brothers and sisters in Christ, family and friends of God. It has been a glorious day in the Lord. It has been my pleasure to be with you as we have celebrated God in praise and in worship. As we prepare to go down, I offer you this final blessing, this word to carry us until we meet again. Will you pray with me? And now may the great God who calls us into destiny, a God who has placed a divine design upon our lives, Walk with us each and every day. Talk with us. Encourage, inspire us. Rock us and hold us and comfort us as we seek every day to be bolder and bolder in our commitment to live as God has called us to live. May this God fulfill in you and fulfill in me his will. May we be bold to depart 
to depart into all that God has in store for us. So beloved, let us walk by faith, not by sight. And let's walk into the places God is calling us to walk. Even if we must depart from the familiar, the comfortable, depart from family and friends, depart from traditions, depart from the way it's always been. But understand departure will bring us back to that which feels familiar. And that is God. This is the blessing we ask over our lives this week in the name of God, who's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's children said, Amen.